So you know that not all carbs are created equal, right? We always talk about that. But did you know that not all starches are created equal too? So in this video, I wanna break down how different starches from different carbohydrate sources respond inside your body and may cause these additional casualties that you didn't quite know about before. If you haven't already, make sure you hit that subscribe button so that you can see all the three to five videos that I'm posting per week, ranging from the topics of fasting, ketosis, general health, and just about everything under the sun relating to wellness. Also, make sure you turn on those notifications. So let's start digging into the science right now. So when we're looking at starches, we really have to look at just two things. There's really only two major components that we have to focus on, and they're two different polysaccharides. One is known as amylose, and one is known as amylopectin. Now, obviously there are different polysaccharides, but these are the two that we wanna focus on because they're the main culprits when it comes down to whether a starch is good or whether a starch is bad. So let's go ahead and let's focus on amylose first. You see, amylose is what is known as a straight chain polysaccharide. What does that mean? It means that the glucose molecules, the actual carb molecules, are in a simple straight chain. Okay, what does this mean? It means that there's not a whole lot of surface area to be able to digest. So believe it or not, this kind of starch takes a longer time to break down because it has less surface area. So what ends up happening is it sits in the small intestine for a little bit, it gets broken down into slightly smaller chunks, and then eventually broken down into short chain fatty acids. I know, you heard me right. Literally, a carbohydrate, a starch, goes into the gut and actually gets converted into a very fast absorbing fat. I know, it's kind of crazy and it sounds bad, but if you hear me out throughout the entire video, I will make sure that you understand that it's actually a good thing. So what this means is it's actually a resistant starch. A resistant starch is what we want, even though it sounds bad again. Resistant kind of sounds bad, but it means that it resists the urge to crazily spike our blood sugar. It resists the urge to spike our insulin. This resistance in this context is actually a good thing. So now let's talk about the other side of the coin. We're talking about amylopectin. Amylopectin, in contrast to amylose, is a highly branched molecule. What does that mean? Well, remember how I said that the amylose has a long, simple chain, just a straight chain that has very little surface area? Well, amylopectin has a lot of little branches, meaning it has a lot of surface area. I want you to visualize this for a second. You have just a simple, straight tree branch, okay? Think about the surface area that is on one single line. Okay, now think about the surface area that is on something that has tons and tons of little branches and twigs. You've got multiple branches upon branches. Think of the surface area that you have to travel. That means you have a lot more absorbency. Okay, and again, first thought, this sounds good. We wanna absorb our carbs. But the thing is, we don't want to absorb our carbs this fast unless, mind you, you know exactly what you're doing or you're trying to break a fast and strategically do something. We don't wanna constantly be spiking our blood sugar or spiking our insulin. So these highly branched molecules end up having a very high molecular weight, which means that it has a higher impact on our bodies. Now, the interesting thing, we don't have just carbs that have just amylose or just amylopectin. All starches have both. It's just a ratio of the two that we have to focus on. Sometimes starches have more amylopectin than they do amylose. And sometimes starches have more amylose than they do amylopectin. It's this ratio that ultimately determines the glycemic index and how we actually respond to a given carbohydrate. So by now you've probably realized that the amylopectin isn't necessarily a good thing. And there's some research to back that up. There was a study that was published in the Journal of Nutrition that was quite basic. Okay, they took test subjects and for 16 weeks they had them eat a high amylopectin diet. They had them eat starches that were very high in amylopectin. Okay, and what they measured after 16 weeks were a couple of things, but mainly they looked at their insulin levels. Well, test subjects ended up having a 50% increase in insulin. But guess what? It doesn't stop there. They ended up having a 50% increase in insulin resistance too. Do you know what insulin resistance is? That's diabetes. Someone that is diabetic is insulin resistant. So that means that a high amylopectin diet ended up contributing not only to higher levels of insulin, but ended up contributing to becoming diabetic as well. Not good. All right, so let's talk about how this actually works. When you have amylopectin and it spikes the blood sugar, you end up having a high rise of insulin. This insulin stops triglycerides from actually breaking down and going into fat cells. So therefore, it causes these triglycerides to float around through the body, causing all kinds of damage and ultimately visceral body fat. We don't want that. Visceral body fat is literally the belly fat, the fat that we get around the stomach. It's not what we want. And literally, amylopectin has a direct link to that because it's keeping our insulin levels elevated all the time. So now we have to get down to brass tacks. What are these high amylopectin foods? Well, some of them are really, really obvious. Some of them are gonna be the things like white bread. 
things like bagels, okay? Things that we know are high glycemic carbohydrates that aren't very good. But then there are some secret ones, and here's how it works. Remember when I talked about the straight chain molecule, that straight chain polysaccharide? Well, what happens if you alter that? What happens if through chemical engineering or through some kind of heating process or puffing process, you change that molecule or that starch? Well, a good example is puffed rice. You have this starch chain that is nice and long and easy and doesn't break down very easily, but you inject air into the process and you change the structure. And now you just created a bunch of branches. So by injecting air, you've puffed the rice and you've now made it high glycemic. So you've made it more amylopectin skewed than you have amylose. Another process is through heating. Think about glucose molecules. What happens when you heat something? It expands. So if you look at a baked potato, a potato when it's raw is actually not high in amylopectin or not that much. But then when you heat it, you expand those glucose molecules and you change the actual structure of the starch. So I want you to start looking at your foods a little bit differently. White rice is a good example too. White rice has a high amount of amylopectin, whereas brown rice has a high amount of amylose simply because of the husk. So I figured if you have an understanding of the amylose and the amylopectin, it'll help you start to make a few better decisions when it comes down to your carbohydrate meals, or when it comes down to your refeed meals if you're on a ketogenic diet, or so that you can make the best decisions when you're actually breaking your fast and know how to have high glycemic foods at the right time and when to have the low glycemic foods. Please, if you have any additional questions or anything like that, put them down in the comment section below. And I'm sorry for my voice being a little bit off. I did catch a cold, which unfortunately totally sucks. And so the couple of videos that you're gonna see, I'm gonna sound a little weird. Anyway, I'll see you in the next video.